Some moments in life are worth waiting for. I've long had dreams of being conditioned well enough to effortlessly glide over the local trails. But today, I'm cheating my way into easy speed and non-draining climbs. I say cheating because to get there, I need some help. The help of an e-bike. And that's a tough order. Finding an affordable e-bike that's capable of handling some of the local trails, but this may just be it. This is the 2020 Unero UHVO. It's a bike with plus-sized wheels, front and rear suspension, and of course, electric power. Priced at $11.99, I wouldn't say this is cheap, but for an e-bike that can handle light trails, that's actually quite affordable. But affordable and good deal are two different things. So let's take a look at the components and see if this is in fact a decent bike or if it's just a pile of cut corners. The UHVO has 31.8 millimeter diameter bars that are 680 millimeters wide and zoom branded. It's also a zoom stem, which is long. And in a year when even big box bikes have shrunk stem length, this is still on out there, 90 millimeters. Faux leather grips, meaning vinyl, somewhat out of place visually on a full suspension mountain bike, but they are comfy. Firm enough for a confident grip, but soft enough to feel good on long rides. There's a trigger shifter and a Serra from Shimano 7 speed, and above that, what's left of the factory equipped bike bell. It was destroyed during shipment, mainly because some of the items looked like they were just thrown in the box before it was sealed up. Random parts and components scattered here and there, including the once happily ringing bell, now pulverized. Since I'm talking about packaging, let me show you the box. There's a nice logo, and wait for it. Sans one word, completely void of English. I think that's a missed target. The instructions, however, are in English, but they don't hit the mark either, because this isn't the computer that's equipped on this bike, which I'll get to in just a second. First, back to the bars, we're going to look below the shifter for the brakes, which are hydraulics, Tektro Origa. Interestingly, no motor cutoff switch integrated into the brakes. Make note, because I'll be coming back to this. This bike also has a throttle, thumb control, beside the left grip, and above that, the bike's computer. Very simple, easy to control, and to see. I'll be coming back to this, too. The head tube badge is metal, and it's the only branding on the bike, and also very Trek looking. The head tube itself is tapered, and the fork, it has dual preload adjusters, 32 millimeter stanchions, and I'm told 110 millimeters of travel. It's apparently also magnesium. Branding Voxa, a brand that I almost purchased recently for another project. There's also a headlight sitting on top of the fork arch, and below that arch, plus size tires. Kenda Havocs, 27.5 by 3.0 on the front and rear wheels. Those are made into rims that are branded Ming Tai Disc. The frame is aluminum, and it has an asymmetrical style chainstay setup, a satin black finish, and a curvy top tube with integrated cable routing. The down tube houses the semi-integrated battery, nice clean lines. The rear frame is all about the full suspension. This bike comes with an Exaform REA5 shock, which is an air shock. Yeah, I was surprised too, and I'm told this has 40 millimeters of travel. All the welds look good, and the shock mounting and pivot system, that looks a lot like the one on the Hyper Hydroform if it were on steroids. And as for the speed controller, that's bolted to the back of the lower seat tube. Nice placement. Now let's look at the drivetrain, which has standard plastic pedals and 170mm pro wheel crank arms. And the one by chain ring, that's a 36 tooth. And that's connected to a Shimano Acera derailleur, which shifts through the seven rear gears. A seven speed freewheel. 14 to 28 tooth. Regular viewers are going to recognize this freewheel. Behind that, the rear hub motor, which is a 350 watter. Now, I'm sure that there was a collective groan when I mentioned that wattage, but I've learned to be more concerned with actual performance than ratings, so we'll see. But it is worth note that when I asked Unero why they omitted the motor cutoff switch on the brake levers, they said because this is only a 350 watt motor. So per them, the hydraulic brakes don't require a switch. Looking at the bottom bracket, I couldn't find the cadence sensor. But after following some wiring, I located it on the drive side behind the chain ring. It's an exposed magnet type. 
I had some trouble locating the quick release seat post clamp, but I found it rolling around in the box and capping the post, a minimalist but not bad looking saddle. For those always curious about seat post sizing, this is 30.4 millimeters. And in the box beside the seat post clamp, I found two loose batteries, and they go with the included tail light, which has three function modes. Big plus sized wheels, a front and rear suspension, the rear part having an air shock, and of course electric power. I'm intrigued and cautiously optimistic. I'm going to cut to the chase and run through all the basics on the street before I get to the trails. First though, I want to mention that this is a review unit that was sent for me to test out, but this isn't sponsored or endorsed. I'm only sharing my observations based on my time with this bike. Now my first dislike. Now I hate leading off with a dislike, but there are a few, but also many things that I'm impressed with, but this is a big deal to me because the computer that I have on this bike is only kilometers per hour. So no mileage, no imperial measurements, only metric. And I contacted Nero and asked them if they thought this was a good idea. This was the bike intended for the US market. They said they were updating the firmware on shipping bikes so that miles per hour would be available as an option. Well, good for those bikes, but this one can't be changed, so I'm going to have to stick with kilometers per hour. Another thing was I had to get an unlock code because the wheel size was set improperly, so every one kilometer registered on the odometer was actually only 0.7 kilometers traveled. But once I was able to get in and make the adjustment, this seems fairly accurate within one to two kilometers per hour. I've already shown that this bike is equipped with a throttle. Well, in addition to that, there are five pedal assist modes. Mode one will get you up to six miles per hour. Mode two, eight miles per hour. Three is 12, four, 18 miles per hour. And mode five, max pedal assist, 25 miles per hour. Going throttle only, meaning no pedaling, letting the bike propel itself, caps out at 20 miles per hour. A couple of notes, cadence on this bike is decently done. Now hub drive motors are usually more on off than true cadence, so it's easy to have a setup where you can run out of pedal. And that can happen on this bike, but only at the apex of its top speed. In town, I found that it cruises exceptionally well for a mountain bike with plus size knobby wheels. It's smooth and bizarrely quiet. The hub motor makes almost no sound. The noises you're hearing isn't the brakes, it's the spokes. Now, I had the bike shop clear it as safe, albeit noisy, but I wasn't gonna pay to have them tightened. And that exposed cadence sensor does a decent job with mostly fast response times. Though, like all cadence sensor equipped bikes, that response time can vary a bit. And what I mean by response time is how quickly the motor disengages when you quit pedaling we'll see in a minute. Overall on the street this is smooth and quiet and bizarrely powerful for a 36 volt 350 watt setup. It does well enough that even on my first few city rides I ended up taking detours anywhere that wasn't paved including utility trails where I found that throttle only mode makes for easy exploring and racking up quite a few miles I was getting around 12 miles per charge in throttle only. Pedal assist, at the max assist, I'm averaging 24 miles per charge. That's at max assist and on hilly terrain. I have no doubt that I could hit 30 miles on flat terrain, even at max assist. Cut to the trail where I was unsure how this was gonna work out as a mountain bike. As I've mentioned before, hub motor driven bikes I don't think are a good idea on trails for the cadence reasons I mentioned earlier, the on off delays plus 350 watts, you know, I've had 500 watt motorbikes out here and they kind of bogged down. Surprisingly, this little 350 watt motor is doing just fine. And I had hints of this around town because it handled city hills so well. The trail though, that's a different set of demands. And there are some valid concerns. I've mentioned that motor shutoff delay and how it can be bad news on the trail because it's amazing how a little unintended boost, even a subtle one, can cause problems on turns and overshooting lines, even subtly pushing into trees. And with no motor cutoff on the brakes to help mitigate that, an extra second or two of power at the wrong time is unnerving to say the least. 
Here's a rough example of what I'm talking about. If I pedal, but then wait till the motor has turned off and I touch the wheel to the ground, it loses all momentum. And now with the cadence delay, touch the wheel to the ground, that extra second or two of power, see how the bike wants to lurch forward? For 350 watts, this has some gusto. And that torque comes in handy on climbs. I didn't have a single hill that I couldn't tackle. Now that's not to say that it doesn't take a bit of leg to work with the assist on large hills, but this bike's output feels well matched for off-road riding. And I'm talking about hills and slopes, and I guess I can say those are slippery slopes because I've become accustomed to easy hill climbs and reaching the top without being winded. It's so casual on this bike that while I was editing this footage together, I had to look for recognizable terrain features to tell which footage was hill climbs. Because everything always looks so flat on camera, but trust me, what I'm riding right now is a lung and a leg burner, and I'm always happy to get to the top where I can catch a break. The difference here is I'm now at the top, I'm not winded, I can get right back up to speed and right back to fun. And by the way, the rattles that you're hearing, that's the battery. But because this is partially exposed, a semi-integrated battery, it'd be easy to resolve with a strip of foam. For me, this bike's been pleasant around town and straight up fun on light trails, but it's not perfect. So let me touch on some of the highs and the lows. The bars and the factory setup is probably more usable on trails than comfortable on city streets, but if I had this bike, I would put 720mm bars on it and ditch this stem for a shorter one. The shifting controls, tried and true with the Shimano Acera, and the hydraulic disc brakes, they do stop the bike efficiently. But that lack of a cutoff on the brakes, I can't overlook that. In my opinion, a critical omission. I've grown used to life with hand sanitizer, so too with thumb throttles. They're okay, and this one works just fine. The computer, it's a bit no frills. There are only selections for cycling between trip or odometer, or selecting between one of the five pedal assist modes. Beyond that, the only thing left is turning on and off the headlight. It's simple and easy to read, even in sunlight. I think it's a winner on a very basic level. Those faux leather grips, you know, they look kind of out of place. They don't fit the bike's aesthetic, but they are comfortable enough to keep, and Mr. Spider seems to like them. This Voxa suspension fork, you know, they said 110 millimeters of travel, but when I measure the grease marks, I get 80. But check this out, it's actually a tapered fork. So not a deal killer, but not great, and it's being pushed on by a bike that weighs 56.6 pounds, so I would probably swap this out for something better if this were my bike. Also of note, at least from a mountain bike perspective, is the head tube angle. It's at 70 degrees, which is steep even by big box bike standards these days. So a steep front end, yes, but the rest of the bike's frame is not only attractive, it appears to be well built. And earlier, I mentioned the suspension mounts and pivots looking like beefed up versions of those found on the Hyper Hydroform, and I mean that, because they really do. One thing they didn't beef up that I wish they would have was not use the same nylon spacers. Okay at $199, not so much at $1199. And I wouldn't have thought that a 36 tooth by 14 to 28 tooth drivetrain would mesh well on this bike, but it actually works out for the most part. Can it run out of pedal? Yes, but not really until it's at the top end of its speed range. And that Acera has worked well enough to keep the chainstay mostly chip free, and this is after multiple trail rides, keeping things looking good. As far as being 350 watts with a 36 volt battery, you know, this is a non-issue for me on this bike because it has enough output to get the job done and have some fun. Your mileage may vary, some people balk at low wattage motors and bikes that don't have a huge battery. And speaking of which, removing the juice box is done via a key lock, and the key is branded starter. I'm sure there's comedy in there somewhere, but the battery is easy to remove. Just insert, turn the key, pull the lever on the battery, and it comes right out. And here's a look at all the battery markings, including the amp hour rating, 36 volt, 10 amp hour. Overall, I would say this bike is a bit of a mixed bag. There is definitely a lot of good here, especially for the money, but there's also some corner cutting that kind of waters it down a bit. I've definitely had fun with it, and I think with just a few minor updates, I could make it into something nice. And it's the closest thing to an e-mountain bike that I've been able to find at this price range. So for me, it would be a good starter. Ooh, starter, key reference. There we go. I was able to tie it in.
Of course, that's assuming if I ordered a shipping bike that it came with a speedometer that was in miles per hour. And by the way, UNIRAL. That's an acronym. It stands for Europe, North America, Australia. Now it's your turn. Comment below and state your opinion on this UNIRAL UHVO and if you think it's worth $11.99. Also, if you're new here, be sure you subscribe and you have that notification bell active. And even if you're not new here, I hope you have that active so you don't miss any upcoming videos. It's the only way to get notifications. Thanks so much for watching Kev Central and have a great day.